This is a wonderful morning for me. I love to teach a Christmas lesson each year, and this is my chance to do it this year. So we're going to do it a little bit different than I have in years gone by. We do have some good music, but I've kind of combined the music with a little bit of quizzing, quizzing with a little bit of teaching. So get ready. Get ready to answer the quiz. I need to know how well you do. There will be multiple guess or choice questions, and uh, you can see how we do. So we start out this year. We're calling this Christmas then to now. And here we begin. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus laid down his sweet Rudolph the red nosed reindeer. <laughs> Had a very shiny nose. And, and that's where we've been. Saw. We started with Nativity, and somehow we've made it to Rudolph, which, by the way, is a typical trivia question at Christmas parties. Did Rudolph have antlers? The answer is yes. You can see from the picture they're nubs, but they still count. That will help you win at the right trivia Christmas party. Thank you. Say, I go to CFBC, Lanier Life Group. Okay, now... If we want to read about the nativity in the Bible, the main places we're going to go are Matthew and Luke. If we go to Matthew, Matthew starts out with the genealogy of Jesus. And the genealogy is not a Christmas tree. It's a family tree instead. And the family tree starts and goes all the way down into Jesus. From there, Matthew transitions into Mary being pregnant says, doesn't go into great detail, just simply says that she, Mary and Joseph had not yet come together as husband and wife, even though engaged, and Mary is pregnant, found to be pregnant. Mary is told that she's going to name the baby. It reads Jesus in our English Bible, because the English Bible is translating the Greek New Testament, which is what Matthew wrote in. The Greek word, Yesu, which is turned into English Jesus, is the Greek version of the Hebrew name Joshua. So the real name that Jesus is Yehoshua in Hebrew or Joshua. Je Yehoshua is the way we would pronounce that Hebrew name. The Yah part means Yahweh or Jehovah. Yahweh and Shua Shuva means salvation. So Jesus' name, the baby that Mary's going to be born or going to carry to term and, and, and mother, is named Yahweh, is salvation. And that's who Jesus is. God with us. God with us not just in the sense of here, but with us in a salvation sense. And so that's what we have. Now, with Jesus being born... Here's your first question. What is the best song in the nativity scene? Is it A, Away in a Manger? Is it B, O Little Child of Bethlehem? Is it C, O Come, All Ye Faithful? How many for A? How many for B? How many for C? Well, you're all wrong. It's D, none of the above. <laughs> you're going to have to do better than that on this quiz. You got to remember a lawyer is giving it to you. There's never a right answer. Here's the best song. And I believe every Christmas song is made to be sung with. So be bold and don't hesitate as these play. If you want to sing, cut it loose. We got Clark out there. 
He can carry the, I mean, well, I could just have Clark up here singing these, and it would be a blessing. Okay, so in the days of King Herod, which, by the way, means Herod died 4 B.C., with all due respect to our calendar, zero is not truly the year Jesus was born. He was born somewhere between 6 B.C. and 4 B.C. And you've probably heard me say in the class before that there was a, a, a monk that was charged to determine when Jesus was born in the 600s when the church decided to transition from the Roman calendar to a Christian calendar. The monk's name was Dionysius Exegus, which is Latin for Dennis the Short. And Dennis the Short was charged with doing it by the Pope, and he messed up a couple of years. So cut him some slack. He was working on without the internet. In the days of King Herod, Jesus was born, and we have that in Matthew. Then we have the story of the Magi visiting Jesus. Now, we know the song... Best song for this? Let's give it a shot. A, no room at the inn. No takers. B, my camel's thirsty. Dr. Bob and a few others. C, we three kings. We three kings of Orient. Now here's the key. If you're reading that song, you read in Matthew, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem and Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Where does it say there were three of them? And where does it say they were kings? It doesn't. Now you might be thinking, well, we know there were three because they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But that doesn't mean there were three. Some may have come and not brought anything. Some may have brought twofers. They might have had, you know, like you get tea in those little containers where the one thing has like all the different flavors. The scripture doesn't say. So where did this come from? If it doesn't say three and it doesn't say king, where do we get the song and the tradition from? You go buy a nativity scene. You'll get a discount if they don't have three of them. Someone will say, this is defective. There aren't three kings. So where does it come from? Well, the number three comes from Genesis 26, 26 through 31. And the early church, in a couple of hundred years after Jesus, taught that Isaac, the son of Abraham, was a, a, a foreshadowing of Jesus, a type of Jesus in the Old Testament, if you will. And it's because Abraham... It was called to sacrifice his son. And God said, no, don't kill him. I'll provide the sacrifice. And Isaac is seen as a predecessor of sorts to Jesus. And in part of that understanding of the Bible, if we go to Genesis 26, and you look at Genesis 26, 26, Abimelech, King Abimelech, went to Abraham from Gerar with, the, with his advisor, Phil Cole, the commander of his army. Isaac said to him, oh, he went to Isaac. I said, Abraham, sorry. Why have you come to me, seeing you hate me? You've sent me away. And they said, we see plainly the Lord's been with you. So we said, hey, let's cut a deal. Now, this is Abimelech who went with Ahuzath and Phil Cole. Three, and those are deemed to be kings. Maybe, maybe not. Probably not. It says they're not kings, but there were three. And so the early church interpreted that story saying that those three are representatives of the wise men, just as Isaac is a representative of Jesus. So those are the, the three magi. Now, how do we get to them being kings? 
Well, we've got to switch from Genesis 26 and go to Isaiah 60 for that. In Isaiah chapter 60, starting with about verse 3, well, let's start at the beginning of the chapter. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you. His glory will be seen upon you. And nations shall come to your light. And kings to the brightness of your rising. And so the early church thought that this is a reference to the brightness of the rising of the star that the magi who came were kings. And this scripture was used for that. Especially because down in verse 6, it adds this. A multitude of camels shall cover you. Young camels, those from Sheba, will bring gold and frankincense. And bring good news, which in the Greek version of the Old Testament is gospel, euangelion will bring good news, the praises of the Lord. So this was deemed at that point to be kings. You put all that together, you have we three kings of Orientar. Boom, you're done. Next, if we want to read in Luke, we read a different perspective on the birth of Jesus. And that's understandable. What was Luke's profession? Doctor. If you're a doctor, What's the thing you most want to know about the birth of Jesus? How did this really happen if you'd not been with a man? And so Luke gets much greater details of the story and is thrilled to get to tell them. So Luke throws some genealogy in there, but Luke has the Magnificat. Now the Magnificat is this passage of scripture where Mary sings this song. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. He's looked on the humble estate of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. Now, there are church traditions that spend a lot more time calling Mary blessed than your typical Protestant Southern Baptist church. But the scripture recognizes she is to be blessed and she is to be honored in a special way. That does not make her deity. That does not make her an item of worship. But it does make her someone worthy of the honor she got from Pastor Stephen this morning when he used her to help teach us how to deal with the interruptions of life. So with that, here's my question. Who's saying the best version of the Magnificat. A. Johnny Mathis. B. Elton John. C. John Mayer. Or D. Juan Miguel de Talbot. It's D. But he goes by his English name, John Michael Talbot. We'll just play a little of it because My the clip's a little long. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. And my spirit exalts in God my Savior. Tremendous song of worship that comes from Mary and, and is a wonderful, wonderful part of any season, but especially Christmas. Now, the Magnificat is not all that Luke adds to the story. Luke also tells us about the angels that were on high. Now, here's my question for this. Who did not sing that song, Angels We Have Heard on High? It comes from the story, an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terribly frightened. The angel said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all the people. Today in the city of David, born for you, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. Suddenly, there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. Now, who did not sing a recording of a song based on that. Who did not? 
A, Carrie Underwood. B, Charlie Brown. C, Nat King Cole. Or D, Amy Grant. Hark the herald angels Who did not sing out of that? Glory to the new Charlie Brown, King. you're right. It's on the show, He's but Charlie's not Earth. singing it. Ha <laughs> ha. Now, let's transition from the Bible, where, by the way, the word Christmas doesn't appear, and there is no indication that the early church celebrated the birth of Jesus. In fact, at the time of the earliest church, the New Testament church, they didn't celebrate anybody's birthday. They celebrated people's death day, but not the birthday. And for a while, the early church thought it was a pagan thing to do, that only wicked people would celebrate a birthday. But gradually, people started celebrating birthdays, and if you're going to celebrate a birthday, you really need to celebrate the birthday of the Lord. So the church starts realizing that, and the church starts working on celebrating the Lord's birth in the early church. So here's how we've got it up here. First of all, December 25th is the day we recognize as Christmas. Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. Jesus probably wasn't born in December. The shepherds are in their fields, right? Shepherds didn't go into the fields with their sheep in December. That's a no-no month. Shepherds would have had their sheep in the fields in the spring, summer, and fall. Most scholars generally agree Jesus was probably born in May. Then the question becomes, why are we celebrating on December 25th? Well, there are two theories. We don't know for certain. The answer's lost in the pages of history. One theory is based on the Roman celebration of the festival of their sun god, Saturnalia. And this was a festival that ended around December 22nd or so. But it was about a week-long drunken bash of partying and revelry. And so the, the one strain of thought, which is still the predominant thought in Europe, is that the early church recognized that, hey, we celebrate our God, Jesus, and we'll celebrate his birth. Also, Jesus in Old Testament prophecy is talked about as the rising sun, S-U-N, and the sun, S-U-N, of justice. So we'll celebrate at about the same time when the Roman world's trying to recover from a week of partying and we won't get in trouble. Because they're all hung over. That's one view. Historically predominant, but the sea has changed in the last four decades, three decades here in the United States. And it's gradually changing worldwide from a book a guy named Tally put out that's, that really explains the calculation theory a whole lot better. Here's the, the, the bottom line for the calculation theory, and I need to move on because we're going to run out of time. Um. There was a time in the early church where in an effort to read the Bible as literally as, as they could, they overread the Bible. And so, for example, where it would talk about Moses lives 120 years. The New Testament, the, the, not New Testament, the, the, the early church thought that meant that Moses died on his birthday. Because otherwise it would have said 120 years, 3 months, and 5 days. But that it said exactly 120 years means he died on his birthday. Well, that's not what the Bible reads. But the church thought the holy men, because all of the holy men in the Old Testament, it gives the years they were when they died, but it doesn't give days. So they thought, well, all the holy people die on their birthday. Certainly Jesus would have died on his birthday. And they did the calculations. And when they did the calculations of the birth of Jesus, they thought, well, you don't really want to calculate that Jesus is going to die on the anniversary of the day he's born. He would die on the anniversary of the day he's incarnated. So, if he's incarnate, they thought he, he um, uh, would have died on his day of birth, and they thought that was March the 25th. 
So if he dies on March the 25th, and that's an anniversary of the date he was incarnated, or Mary is discovered with child, then you add nine months to figure out the day of Bethlehem. Because Bethlehem is going to be nine months later, December 25. And that's how the early church happened upon it. Now, if you know the song, here's the song. Maybe. Maybe not. Okay, do you know this song? Let me try it again. Go back to my PowerPoint. Thank you. Midnight. He was born at midnight. You know the song? It came upon the midnight clear That glorious you know song, right? song of glory So here's your trivia question on this one. From angels bending me Here's your trivia question on this one. Why did the early church celebrate midnight? with the idea Jesus was born at midnight. Why does the song have, it came upon a midnight clear? You ready for your choices? A, it fits better than 345. B, that's as good a time as any. C, we're going to use it at midnight mass. Or D, the Apocrypha. The answer is, I got you all nervous about guessing anything. E, no, the answer is D, the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha in a book called Wisdom of Solomon. And so that's in the Catholic Bible. It's not in the Protestant Bible. In Wisdom of Solomon, you have this passage. While gentle silence enveloped all things and the night in its swift course was half gone. Your all-powerful word leapt from heaven. And, of course, John called Jesus the word. And so the early church took that to mean that at midnight Jesus was born, when the night was half gone. And that's uh, where that came from. That's why we have the song. And I'll give you something more. That ultimately becomes why we have Christmas as a name. Here's what happens. Let's move it into what we'll call celebration in the modern church. By the year 300, you have a lot of Christmas hymns being written. We've still got some of them today. One that happens to be my favorite is from an earliest hymn writer. His name was Marcus Aurelius Prudentius, middle name was, or the C name was Clemens. Marcus Aurelius Clemens Prudentius. Here's your question. This early Christmas hymn writer was trained as what? A, a doctor. B, a plumber. C, an astronaut going to help you out on this one. We're looking at about 390 A.D., okay? D, a lawyer. And the answer is D. And here's one of his Christmas hymns. the world began to be, he is Alpha and Omega, the source, the end. Uh, that is a, a, a later medieval melody with the words, but uh, it's one of these early Christian hymns. So you've got the hymns being written by 300 A.D. Now, if we fast forward by 1000 A.D., you've got a mass that's happening at midnight because that's when the church thought Jesus was born. So the midnight mass was called, to distinguish it from other masses, Christ's Mass. Because it was the Mass at midnight to celebrate the birth of Christ. Well, it doesn't take long, of course, before Christ's Mass, the start of a day, the day after you have Christ's Mass, or the day that begins with Christ's Mass, is Christ's Mass Day. 
which is what Christmas Day is for us today. Nativity scenes, they came in the 1200s. St. Francis of Assisi started the nativity scenes, also started a lot of caroling. The Franciscan monks would carol, and that's the tradition of caroling. Started with the Franciscans, they'd go around, they'd set up the nativity scenes to teach about Jesus, and they would sing Christmas carols. Before long, at this point in history, Christmas took a wrong turn. There came what we'll call Middle Age revelry, and Christmas became just an excuse for drunken, bawdy, horrible celebration. Christ was lost from Christmas. And it got so bad over the decades that when the Reformation movement started, one of the things some of the Reformers and the Puritans especially brought out was that Christmas should be illegal. It was just used as a time and an excuse for drunken partying. And so, for example, in the 1600s in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, before the U.S. was a, an independent nation, Christmas was illegal to celebrate. And still there is a strain of Protestantism that will not celebrate Christmas. And, it, and this is where the roots are chased. Now, things altered a little bit here in the uh, United States of America. They altered also in Europe. But in the United States of America, if you roll into the 1900s, New York City in the early 1900s was a horrendous place to live. The children that were destitute and on the street were innumerable. The cold, the hunger, the crime that was associated with it was such that the community was in an uproar. What do we do about all of the children that are criminals, that are in the gangs, that are, are basically making life impossible for civilization to exist in New York City? In come some different ideas. Among them, the ideas put out by Clark Clement Moore, who decided what these children really needed was a reason to behave. A motivating reason. What better reason could there be than the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse? And Clark Clement Moore took this concept of Santa Claus, as we call now, and making a list, and checking it twice. And who's going to be naughty and nice? Though that song had not come out yet. That was the invention, if you will, of Clark Clement Moore. Now, Santa Claus himself, how did that brilliant idea come up? Well, let's go to the Elmo for a moment. Santa... Claus. Does Claus have an E at the end? No, is that right? Okay, that's good. Santa. Some of you speak Spanish. What does Santa, Santa mean in Spanish? Saint. The Dutch word is center. And center means saint. Center now, there was a saint from the early church in the 300s named Saint Nicholas. But Nicholas, the Dutch people would abbreviate, and he was Center Kallus, Kloss. The way it's kind of pronounced. It becomes Santa Claus. He was, uh, St. Nicholas was the patron saint of children. And so there were legends around. We don't know that much about St. Nicholas. We know he lived. We know he lived in Turkey. We know he was a uh, an elder of the church. We know that he was uh, uh, at one of the important early church councils. And then after Nicholas died, these stories started about him as a gift giver and a protector of children. One of the early stories about St. Nicholas is that there was a man who had three daughters and he didn't have the dowry money necessary to marry those daughters off. So the man was going to have to sell his daughters into slavery to have enough money to live on. 
So when word got out, the man one night goes to sleep. He wakes up the next morning and someone has thrown through his window a little satchel of gold coins, good enough to keep him from selling off the first daughter and providing a dowry so she could marry. Got the same thing for the second daughter, the same thing for the third daughter. Found out that it was St. Nicholas who did it, but St. Nicholas swore him to secrecy and said, you're not allowed to tell anybody till after I die. That is the legend and the historical story that Clark Clement Moore and others seized on with Nicholas, St. Nicholas, Sinterklaas, being the patron saint of children who's going to give gifts in some private secret manner that nobody's going to know about overnight. And the legend is born. Now, December 6th is your feast day of St. Nicholas. If you go to Germany, though, you're going to celebrate with the idea of Kris Kringle, which comes from the old German Kris, which was the way you would say Christ. And Kindle is the old German for child. We get kindergarten from it. And so Chris King Kringle is the Christ child celebrated through Germany. Now we move forward. Today, what do we have? Christmas trees. Where did those come from? Lots of rumors. Luther, uh, one of the, the, the rumors, uh, one of the legends, I should say, that's got really no basis in historical fact that I can find or any other body that I've read can find, is that one night, Christmas Eve, Luther's walking home. And as he's walking home, it's, it's been an ice storm. So there are icicles hanging on some evergreen trees. And he sees the starlight through those icicles and thinks it's so pretty. He chops the tree down, takes it into his home, and then hangs candles from it. Really nice story probably totally made up. We do know in America the first reference to a Christmas tree is in a journal in 1821. Trees were being used to celebrate Christmas as a household decoration in Germany before that. And the odds are a German family up and around Germantown in Pennsylvania or one of those areas heavily settled were one of the first to start with Christmas trees. But boy, they caught on like wildfire. And uh, uh, we now have them today with lots of symbolism built into them. But that symbolism is stuff that people have built onto the tree. It wasn't originally with the tree. Now, I still love how commercial we've gotten. And I can't leave without telling you that a guy named Rudy May really struck it rich. In the 1940s, there used to be a, a department store called Montgomery Ward's. How many remember Montgomery Wards? Yeah, it was like Sears and Roebuck back before it went bankrupt. Now it's gone. So Montgomery Wards put out, wanted to put out a holiday get me so that people would come in. And so they got Robert May to write this wonderful little song called Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And they started selling these little pop-out books. By the way, you'll notice in this picture of the original, he's still got those little nubs on his head. So that's going to win you the trivia question. It's going to come, and you're going to be able to say it because you've now seen the original photograph from an original copy of Robert May's selling material. Now, that wasn't just a get-rich-quick for Robert May and Montgomery Wards. Gene Autry recorded it, made wonderful success with the song. It's still with us today. So with that, let's go to points for home. A Savior has been born, glory to God in the highest. If you've got a chance to start deciding if you want to take the New Year's resolution plunge and read through the Bible in a year with us next year, we'll be starting with the beginning. And we'll move soon through the nativity. And it's a marvelous opportunity to see not only what happened, but as I was working through the scriptures to put it together, I was reminded anew of what life would be like if it had not happened. 
I don't know how people can handle whether it's what Pastor Stephen was talking about with the interruptions of life. But I don't know how people can handle life at all. I certainly could not handle life if I did not have the confidence that not only is there a God, but there's a God who cares about me enough to keep His Word at His expense to reach down all the way to me. Because I can tell you, all of us can reach up to God. You, some of us, oh, some of y'all are better than the rest of us. You might have better reach. And you might be able to reach up to God tremendously high. But it doesn't matter how good we are and how good our reach, God still had to reach down all the way. And that's the beauty of the story. A Savior has been born. Not a good man, not a nice guy, not an icon, but a Savior has been born. Glory to God in the highest. And the Savior's name is given as Jesus. Matthew says, for he will save his people from their sins. Jesus, Yehoshua, Yahweh, saves. And that's who we have. So with that, I wish you all a Merry Christmas. And I pray God's deepest blessings on you. And I can't wait till next year when we are going to go through this Bible together.